Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. Shall we open our Bibles to Luke 14, 25 this morning? We are nearing the end of Jesus' public ministry. <clears throat> It is maybe three months out now from the cross. The crowds are huge. <clears throat> the opposition is more fierce than ever. And the disciples are tagging along, learning lessons along the way as the Lord presses hard to go towards the cross. In Luke chapter 14 through verse 10 of chapter 17, Luke goes out of his way to give to us a long day of, of Sabbath day in Jesus' earthly ministry where he meets with various groups, talks to them about various things. For the last couple of weeks on Sunday morning, <clears throat> as we started chapter 14, we went with the Lord to a dinner where he had been set up by the Pharisees to, to try to discredit him. They had brought a sick man into the dinner. They knew that the Lord would heal him. And since it was the Sabbath, they thought they could use it against him. Such an odd picture. They knew he would be healed, but somehow that didn't move them at all. The Lord, in, in sharing with them about their self-service and self-glory, gives us an example of witnessing where you don't go to John 3.16 first. <laughs> you kind of go to sin first, because until you recognize your sinfulness, there's really no need for help. And so <clears throat> the Lord talked to them about the way they go to the, to the parties, to where they sit, to the greetings in the marketplace, all this kind of self-service. This morning, the Lord leaves this dinner, and he heads down the road with an enormous crowd following him, a crowd that seems to have been growing daily. Some of them were more excited than ever because the Lord did something none of them could do. He stood up into the face of these religious leaders. But Jesus wasn't impressed with the size of the crowd. In fact, he knew that many of them were there for all the, the wrong reasons. <clears throat> and that is something that he will address this morning <clears throat> as we go through our verses down through verse 35. As the day of the cross drew near, he wanted to talk to the crowd about the cost of following him and what the difference was between being in the crowd or with the crowd and being a disciple that would walk with him on the path of serving the Father no matter the cost. From a contextual standpoint, this follows on, on the heels of, of last week's excuses made by many on why they couldn't come to him. The I musts of last week, lots of weak reasons that, you know, they wouldn't put him first in their lives. They had other things to do. <clears throat> Years ago, Annie Gil, uh, Dillard wrote a, an essay called A Expedition to the, to the Pole. It was written about an 1845 expedition led by a guy named Sir John Franklin out of, in, uh, out of England where they took two, uh, three masked ships and 140 people or so and they, they set off to try to find the Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean. As she wrote the letter, she described every vehicle, uh, vessel I should say, they brought a, an auxiliary steam engine they brought five, uh, 12 days supply of coal. The trip was expected to last three years. But instead of bringing extra coal, they brought a hand organ with 50 tunes set in it. They brought china for every place setting. They, they brought cut glass goblets that they could drink from. They brought sterling flatware that were engraved with every person's initials. They didn't bring any Arctic clothing at all. And they did bring a set of Her, Majesty, Her Majesty's Navy uniforms. They set out with a band playing. And two months later, a whaling ship near Lancaster Sound saw them for the last time. For the next 20 years, pieces of this boat and bodies that were frozen were brought back because they underestimated the requirements of an Arctic expedition. Foolish, for sure. Exchanging necessities for luxuries, they perished. 
Well, in the same manner, really, Jesus is now headed for Jerusalem and the cross, his believing followers close behind. But in the years to come, the saints are going to head for tremendous difficulty. In fact, many of them will be martyred for their faith in the next couple of hundred years of the church. Persecution was almost inevitable. There were some rough seas ahead and a difficult road. And Jesus, as he comes out of this dinner, looks at this huge crowd and he warns them of the cost. How is this going to work out? Do you, you realize what you're signing up for? We read in verse 25, now a great multitude went with him and he turned to speak to them. Jesus had shared last time that he wanted the table of the marriage supper to be full. But even in the example, it was that full commitment that was missing. I, I'll come, but I've got other things to do. And so unwilling to count the cost or pay the price, there were a lot of kind of outward commitments made to him that really didn't motivate them to follow through in their walks with him. If you look at the crowds, at least the way they're described in the Gospels, there were certainly a lot of people that were hangers-on, that they came simply because there was a crowd. <laughs> I mean, there's a crowd, there's got to be something going on. For some, it was the entertainment of Jesus doing these mighty works, and no one had ever seen things like that. And then there was that constant drama between him and the religious leaders. And so, at least the crowd seemed like people were off on holiday, as opposed to really being moved in their hearts by the Savior who had come. So what we're going to read this morning, the reality check from Jesus, is very stern, but, but again, it's very merciful. One of the things that you will discover from the Lord is that the Lord never asks anyone to follow him without telling them what they're getting into. He lays it out very clearly. In fact, sometimes you read and you go, well, that's no way to make a disciple. Nobody's going to want to join on that group. But the Lord is very straightforward. He tells them the cost involved. He even shares the glory that will follow. But he is, you know, also willing to discourage lighthearted commitments and those who come and follow under false pretenses. <clears throat> so I, I think Jesus did what Sir John Franklin never did. His failed expedition was because no one was prepared where they were going. Jesus tells the would-be disciples, take this seriously, count the cost. And I think that, taken seriously, the crowds would have been thinned out for sure. They wouldn't have gotten bigger, they would have gotten smaller. Think about that example that we have, for example, in Judges chapter 7. It happened 1,200 years before we, what we're reading this morning, but the situations are very similar in the sense that Gideon and the children of, of Israel were under bondage. They, they couldn't get out on their own. The enemy was more powerful than they were. They were overpowering. The task of even seeking to oppose them was frightening. In fact, everyone was hiding in caves and, and trying to eke out an existence without the enemy finding out where they were. It is into that situation that God goes to call a young man, Gideon, to lead the Jews in a battle against the oppressing Midianites. Almost sounds like an impossible situation. God chose a weak and frightened and clearly incapable person to lead the charge. Over time, and you can go read the story in chapters 6 and 7, over time God revealed to Gideon that who he was and what he would do. But faith for Gideon and for us oftentimes comes slowly in the midst of such frightening opposition. When finally the armies of Israel were called, only 32,000 men even showed up. There were a lot more men than that in Israel. But they came to fight with Gideon that day. But like the big crowds here with Jesus, many of them neither had the heart nor the spiritual confidence in God that they could serve, that they could win. They were there, <clears throat> but they weren't really there. The Lord looked at them and said to Gideon, I don't want them by their bulk to think that somehow if they win this battle, they will leave congratulating themselves and 
not relying upon me, even though 32,000 against what we read in Judges was an enemy that was far stronger and far more numerous. The Lord didn't want them coming away patting themselves on the back. Imagine Gideon hearing from the Lord, this army was too many. It's too what? Many. And God tells him to send home the fearful. And 22,000, thank you very much. And off they go. Which left Gideon with 10,000 men. But God still wasn't really ready to work. He wanted those who would trust him. He wanted them to learn that he could be trusted. So he devised a little test. He said to get in, tell them to get a drink out of the well. 9,700 of them got on their faces, stuck their head in the water, in so doing took their eyes off the enemy and got a drink. The Lord said, you put them on that side. 300 of them were more circumspect. They, they took a drink with their hands, but their eyes were still up and looking around. And the Lord said, you can send the 9,700 home. With these 300, I'm going to bring victory. I will use them. It took Gideon and the 300 some time to be convinced. But kind of in a similar matter, Jesus here speaks to the multitudes, but he's looking for individuals who will understand the cost of following him. No matter the difficulty, Convinced of who he is, like Gideon, finally assured that God will do it. He goes to obey the Lord, and, and I'll tell you, if you go read the story, the battle plan was pretty weird, but it worked because God was in it. The disciples were all in, but many in these crowds were anything but in. So Jesus turns to the crowd and he says this, verse 26, If anyone comes to me <clears throat> and doesn't hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We will find three times in this short little passage, verse 26, 27, and again in verse 33, that the Lord will use these words, you cannot be my disciples. This is what would disqualify you. And the three references are to a lack of devotion, a lack of priority, and a lack of willingness to count the cost. The term disciple, mephites, learner, is the most often used word in the scriptures for those who would follow the Lord. It is used about 250 times in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And it speaks of someone who's learning, training, uh, an apprentice, a follower. You read this verse, though, and unless <laughs> you didn't read it properly, it, it immediately stops you in your tracks. It's a shocker. And I think that it is designed by the Lord for just that purpose. Certainly in, in the entire Bible, if we take it together, we would be careful not to misinterpret these words of Jesus or to keep them correctly in their context. For example, you're told to honor your father and mother, but to hate them. You are told that children are a blessing from the Lord. We're told that a husband should love his wife like Christ loves the church, that kids are a faithful example of the dependence that we need to have upon Jesus, who often took them in his arms and blessed them. All of those things are biblically correct. We are told to love one another, to love our enemies, to love our neighbors. <laughs> All right, Jesus, what are you saying? What is your point? In, in, in the broad relief, it is certainly an issue of contrast. Look, he is speaking to a great multitude to evaluate whether they stood, where they stood regarding him and his word and what he is calling them to do. Jesus uses the term hate here in terms or in context of comparison. If you're going to be my disciples, Jesus said to this big crowd, 
you must love me in such a way that all other loving relationships pale by comparison. It really is a matter of devotion. That the, whatever else you have going on in your life, that those things have to be subordinate to the very relationship and commitment that you have to Christ. Or if you will, he wants to be first. And he'd like to stay first. In every way. Every other relationship must be and take second place. And by the way, according to the Bible, if Jesus is first, all those other relationships flourish. They become better, not worse. When the priority is out of whack, that's when you suffer. When the Lord is no longer the Lord and self takes over, that's when there's problems to be had. So to be Jesus' disciple means that you love him primarily. If a decision has to be made between serving the Lord and serving others, he wins. Time for you, time for him, he wins. Your service, your worship, he wins. And if you ask yourself by that definition, am I a disciple of Christ? Understand Jesus was shaking the tree here. Thousands of people just, <laughs> it was a party. That's not really what he was interested in. He wasn't interested in the numbers. He was interested in the heart. How many people excuse themselves because of their involvement in so many other things? And that's really in line with what he taught to the disciples and to the Pharisees last week. Busy schedules, job pressures, life in general. And so I find myself excusing myself so often for the very things that the Lord would like to do in my life, but, you know, I'm pretty busy. I think uh, one of the roles of a father is to bring his family to Christ, teach the kids his word and make it a priority. If we would spend as much time investing in the spiritual well-being of the kids as we do in their athletic development or their intellectual pursuits or their cultural and social well-being, we could turn out some pretty heavy-duty looking kids, spiritually. If you would put as many miles on your car taking the kids to church as you do taking them to soccer games, you'd find some real disciples. Disciples of Jesus, according to his words, are haters of, in the sense that they really are ready to place second anything and everything that seeks to take his place as first. The cost may be very harsh at first. I know, you read it, you just want to water it down a little bit. Oh, that's not what he means. I want to redefine that. But if Jesus has first place, everything else is better. So to the, to the would-be follower, with great mercy, although you're right, it's, it's harsh. He says this, if you want to follow me, I need to be first. It's a cost to be his disciple. There's not a rosy picture here. It requires taking a stand, not simply milling around in the crowd. Do you love me more than these? That's what Jesus would say to Peter in restoring him. Do you love me more than these? So, a life handed to him without compromise. You know, when Satan made the accusation against Job when he stood in God's presence, and Job pointed out his faithfulness, Satan said, well, you know, a man will give anything for his life, skin for skin. Take his health away, he'll turn on you. He didn't. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So, <laughs> I don't imagine that that crowd might have all hung around by the time this came out of Jesus' mouth. Secondly, verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I think whenever the Lord says cannot be three times, we ought to pay attention. It's important I know that he, what he doesn't like. There is a cross to bear in following Jesus. It's not his cross. It's yours. But what is the cross that Jesus is speaking of? 
Let me tell you what it isn't. It isn't putting up with noisy neighbors. Oh, they're my cross to bear. Or a difficult spouse. Or a hard job. Or economic distress. Those are not the crosses that Jesus is calling you to. When Jesus went to the cross, he went there to bear our sins. To declare a message that cost him his life. He sacrificed himself and laid himself out for the sake of others. So as I give him first place in my life and surrender myself to him, he's going to want to use me for the benefit of others. I'm going to have to be a witness for him. I'm going to have to stand in the marketplace and speak his word. I'm going to have to identify myself with him. In fact, in the process of walking with the Lord, my suffering in many ways comes at me for my identification with the Lord to begin with. Which is why Jesus there in John 15 said, look, a servant isn't greater than his master. If they've persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they keep my word, they'll keep yours also. But these things they'll do to you for in my name's sake, because they don't know him who sent me. In other words, when you're going to give your life to the Lord, he's going to use your life. And the cross for you is the identification that you have with him, and it's a suffering that takes place for the sake of others. So they might see, that they might hear, that they might know him better. Peter wrote to the church at large years later, Beloved, don't consider it strange concerning the fiery trial that's to try you, if some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in to the extent that you have been partakers now of Christ's suffering, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You are now being reproached for the name of Christ, but happy are you for the spirit of, uh, or blessed are you, I think, uh, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's being blasphemed, but on your part, he's being glorified. What is picking up your cross? It is living your life for the Lord in such a way that you share in the rejection that he faced. But he did so, so that those who would listen and hear would turn to him. Paul, when he wrote to the Colossians in chapter 1, said, I, I rejoice in my sufferings for you as I fill up in my flesh what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. That's really the cross. Anyone you hear saying, well, it's my cross to bear. Unless you're reading right, you're going to have a hard time with that kind of an understanding. Jesus in the garden sweat great drops of blood as he faced the task of bearing the sins of the world and the consequence that came with him. The worst of all, he would be separated from his father because that's what sin does. And yet he prayed, nevertheless, Father, not my will but yours be done. So we must be first willing to put him first, and then to pay the price for identifying with him. It'll bring persecution. It can bring isolation. You can suffer loss for your identification with Jesus. But at the same time, those that are wanting to be reached, that the Lord wants to get a hold of, that your life can be a part of, in the midst of that bearing of your cross, folks are going to find the Lord. Are we a disciple of Jesus? Well, Jesus tells then two little parables back to back here so that they could, the crowd, calculate the cost for themselves. In fact, both of them are applied in verse 33, but here's what he said in verse 28. Which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with his 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation to make and, and ask for conditions of peace. 
when Jesus says, so likewise, whoever of you that does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Both are applied here in the last verse, and, and the kind of, the, the final application brings the first two together. A willingness to count the cost up front, and then be willing to fight to the end, not stop in the middle, because you've considered what you're getting yourself into. If you look at both of these little parables, uh, illustrations, they're pretty similar. They just have a very slight difference of emphasis. The builder of the tower was free to build or not build. Nobody was forcing his hand. This was his own decision. He, he built based on the information of cost and resources. And he didn't do a very good job of looking at the bottom line. He didn't realize what might come his way. He, he didn't calculate properly. The king who was under attack <clears throat> had to make a decision fairly quickly. I mean, lives were at stake. Am I going to fight or am I going to send out a peace party in hopes of avoiding certain defeat. <clears throat> Both parables emphasize the need for careful calculation. You got to think it through. <laughs> what are you getting involved with? Take some time, compute it out. The downside of not calculating was to either be the laughing stock of the world who watched or, or, or defeated by an enemy you couldn't stand up against, overthrown or worse. So the third ingredient, verse 33, I must put him first, count the cost, and forsake all that I have, devoted to this one thing. I want to be a follower of Christ. I will put my love for Jesus above everything else. I will be willing and must be willing to pick up my cross and follow in the world. Sometimes that's very difficult. When the cost is high, when the price is high, when the times as we live even today is very difficult, we're going in that direction. My plans, my ambition, my availability have to belong to him. Jesus, when he spoke to the disciples, said in back in John 12, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it can produce much grain. If you love your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life in this world, you will receive it and gain it for eternal life. If you want to serve me, then follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be. And if you'll serve me, my father will be honored. It's the same thing that Jesus says to this huge throng standing around him. I think oftentimes Christians live and walk in a way that can best be described as, as convenient. We will do what we want, when we want, on our own terms, as long as it doesn't put me out too much, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Uh, if I am not properly acknowledged, though, if you're not thanked for my efforts, if I'm not given consideration for my time, I'm out of here. And then there's this disciple of Jesus. I thought about the rich, rich young ruler this morning. He, he'd gotten so close to the Lord, missed the invitation. Got so close. Had so many things going on, he missed the invitation. Jesus did practice what he preaches here. At Capernaum, when his family gathered together there in Matthew 12 and said, your mom's outside, your brothers, they, they think you've lost your mind. The crowds were huge, and Jesus said, who's my mother and who's my brothers? And he stretched out his hand to the disciples, and he says, here they are. Here's my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he's my brother, my sister, my mother. When he was 12 years old, he, he got away from his parents. <laughs> I guess that wasn't sin, though. It had to be close. No, he had no idea. When they finally found him in the temple... It was Jesus who said to them, why do you seek me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? First things first. John chapter 8, regarding God's will, he said, when you lift up the Son of Man, you'll know that I am he, and that I've done nothing of myself. Whatever my father has taught me, 
I, that's the things I'm speaking to you. And he's the one who sends me. My father's with me. I'm never alone. I do always those things which please the father. And Paul describes Jesus leaving his, his heavenly home in Philippians chapter 2, where he said he didn't just look on his own interest, but on the interests of others. So let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God didn't consider it be robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He made himself and brought as himself as in the form of a bond servant, and he came in the likeness of men, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death. So I think three months out from the cross, Jesus, I don't know if he turns up, turns up the heat or turns up the, the decibels, but he doesn't want these folks to leave without knowing what they're doing and following him and how it's going to go down the road. You don't want to get halfway home and then change course. Jesus forsook all to save us. He just wants you to forsake all to be his disciples. So he ends with these words, verse 34. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? And if it is, if ne it is neither fit, sorry, for the land, nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. And then Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. It is the same example that the Lord used in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. In Jesus' day, salt was more than just a seasoning. It was a preservative. You didn't have a refrigerator. So you rub salt on the outside of a meat and it killed the bacteria, retarded spoilers. And when you wanted to eat, you just kind of scraped off that outer layer and you could still eat. Then you would do the same thing over and over. So pretty good example for people to relate to. And Jesus says to the disciples and to us, you're the salt of the earth. You're there to retard evil, to slow the rotting process of sin, to be an influence. As salt is also a, uh, if you will, seasoning. Salt tends to make things taste better, and it causes you to be thirsty. So folks that meet you should want what you have. <laughs> and mm, that looks good. I'd like to have a drink of that. But if salt doesn't do those things, if the, if the church doesn't do them, if they don't accomplish that, Jesus said the church is really good for nothing. Salt is too briny to be thrown into the fields. They're too, it's too caustic to be thrown into a fertilizer heap. It is only best used to, to throw on a road that's you know, iced over or snow, and people just kind of trample underfoot. But the Lord ends by the, the, the crowds before in, in fact, in verse 1 of chapter 15, it seems to have hit home with a lot of those that were really suffering in their sin. Because all of a sudden, there's a bunch of tax collectors and sinners that are drawn to him. Are you listening? That's what he ended up with. Are you listening? Are you the soft of the earth? Are you like Joseph was in Egypt, or Daniel was with the boys in Babylon, or Esther was in her generation? The result, like I said in verse 1 of chapter 15 and beyond, is that some in the crowd understood the call. And so they, they go to him, get near. I, whatever it costs, we want what you have. And what's interesting is as you read through chapter 15, which is still the same um, context, that the Lord then begins to use them to reach out as vessels to others. And they find great joy in finding the lost, represented by finding a lost valuable coin or a lost valuable sheep or a return of a lost son. The fruit is many come. The gone astray are welcomed home. But the Lord is interested that the disciples and the crowd realize that following him has three challenges. There's a lack of devotion, can be a lack of priority, and then there's just a lack of willingness. But if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, he's going to be first in all that, in all that we think, in all that we do, in all that we say. 
And our prayer is, Lord, make us disciples. Amen? Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. And they're stern, Lord, and they're, they're words that take us back and certainly stop us in our tracks. But at the same time, we realize, Father, that you're serious. You want us to be serious about the cost of following you. And, and we, we certainly live in a generation where being a Christian and standing up for Christian values is now considered hateful and racist and narrow-minded and bigoted and defined to be evil when it is indeed good. And we find ourselves in a generation where, where evil is called good and good is called evil. But it's the church, your people, that are to be the salt of the earth, dedicated to you, first in our hearts, first on our programs, first in our desires. And as we do those things, you'll send us out and the world will see and fruit will follow and lives will be preserved and sin will be defeated. Lord, that you would make us disciples of Jesus. We don't want to just be in the crowd. We want to be those close to you that have no apologies for our faith and we'll walk in love towards the lost, but will not compromise or turn from what you've set before us. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you made on our behalf. May we be faithful to keep you first in our hearts today, we ask. In Jesus' name, shall we stand?